I'm here with Vismai Schoenfelder. Welcome, Vismai, uh, to Bon Yoke. We're here in Mallorca. We just got through with uh, the Cara Europe in Barcelona. So we had an absolutely, again, very, very moving experience. Vismai was one of the wonderful presenters that we had there. And he's been at the last three of the last four, I think. Mm -hmm. And we also coincided in Australia. And Vismai has an unbelievable story to share and a very beautiful and unique perspective on chiropractic and on practice. And I want to go into a little bit of that today and also sort of where you're going from here and well, how you created all that and, and what your plans are for the future. So welcome to Vismai. Thank and you. It's really nice to be down in Mallorca after coming off the back of Cairo Europe from Barcelona. Okay, so so what it, what draws you to Cairo Europe? Well, we've been involved with the community now fifteen years actually, and um, it's it's been really the glue to our success that happened in our practice in Holland, just north of Amsterdam. So the community is a really big one, um, and I think it's just that constant reminder of, of what we're actually essentially doing as chiropractors. It's quite easy to go off track and get dragged into the symptoms and pleasing people and at least I found it difficult when the whole world seems to be doing that and then coming back to that seminar we, we always came with our entire team um, it was just a really strong reminder to stay with um, universal intelligence as a guiding force for, for the chiropractic yeah we uh, this this one and his team were there over and over and over again but I didn't really understand what he, where he was coming from he's very gentle and soft-spoken and um, I get bombarded with requests to speak and sort of stuff. And this one I was very much in the background, and not. And I so I didn't really understand this my story until we hooked up, I guess, a couple of years ago in Bali. So we were going to Australia to do a coaching there, and he very generously offered to let us stay at his house, and. We, one of my family went out there first, but anyway, so I went out there and we spent a day on the beach and he's telling me his story. And the thing that like smacked me in the head was PVA of 2000. And I'm like, what? Wait a minute, wait a minute. Like, stop, what did you just say? And then, you know, I go through my deal of, you know, like rapid fire machine gun questions because mm -hmm. most of what I hear from people is bullshit, but he actually genuinely did have a PVA of 2000. Um, and it's like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, how did you create this? I mean, like, what did you do to do this? And it's an absolutely incredible, unbelievable story. So, um, you want to talk a bit about it, or? Yeah, I think uh, there's a couple of parts to it. There's definitely the driving force to it, and there's been a bit of luck during my experience as a chiropractor with the people that have come on my path. Um, Not true. There's no luck about it. He worked his ass off. Yeah, I worked my ass off. I was intensely focused, for sure. But just to start, to give a bit of context, um, I'd studied the first three years of chiropractic, and I got the, I was 17, I think, when I went into chiropractic school, so I was quite young. And it was my dad that suggested I should go and see the world, actually, before I graduated as a chiropractor. To cut a long story short, I collapsed walking off a bus in Ga uh, Ghana, in my head. West Africa and I woke up 10 days later in London in quarantine and during that period I had two near-death experiences which really took me I had the whole enchilada I had the, the classic experience that you really read about the short movie of the perfectness of your life entering the tunnel of life being in the space finally getting to the end of that tunnel and going into this expansive form of what I call universal intelligence and that experience really helped me connect a lot and of dots. And were in you conscious of this experience? I obviously were, because you remember it now. But I remember it more than I remember you sitting here. Actually, it's it's more like it's made this life more of a dream than that experience itself. Just simply because it's it's like when you get when you get to your death, you it's almost like um, universal intelligence shows you the joke of life all the seriousness and all the problems and we all do you have, have any concept of time through the process? No, so there's no linear time at all. So 
this might sound strange to most people, but there's no distance either. Like a distance could be, um, honestly, it could be like two centimeters away or 20 million kilometers. You can't tell the difference. Have you done dispensers courses? No. You really need to. I bet he's broken up courses. You really need to do the courses because he talks about that at great, great, great weight. Okay, yeah. So but there's anyway, no linear so, time. Yeah. Time was, um, everything was just bleh, all in yeah. one. It's a bit like, if you could, the only way I can liken it to is if you could watch a two-hour Hollywood blockbuster film in like two seconds and hear everything, see everything, feel everything, get all the jokes, get all the dramas, get all the idiocy yeah. and all the messages and all that, all in one or two seconds wow. and a two-hour film. That's the only sort of linear way I could explain it to you. And you don't miss a detail, like everything from color shoes you got from your mum when you were eight years old through to... And so do you have access to that now? Yeah, that whole That whole movie? Time. The whole... All the time. The whole thing, like the details, like little details in that movie, scenes... Well, it's more like now, of course, I'm not in that experience anymore, but when anything goes right or wrong in my life, I really put it in perspective. Okay. Of that. Okay. The universal intelligence always pointing me in the direction to get me to know who I am. Oh. That's the gift I got from it, so... It's not that you don't have any problems in life. It's not like that at all. Like I've got any problems that any other person has who's running a business and he's married and he's having a family. And, um, but the perspective's different. You sort of have this secret with yourself that it's yeah. all helping you to get to know who you are. Right. So, but something quite significant happened because um, my parents weren't in London and um, it so happened that a quite a serendipitous thing. They opened up my um, personal things the out of my people. backpack yeah. the hospital people. And they, I had a yellow post-it sticker on the inside of my travel diary and it just had a yellow post-it sticker with the name Cam and his telephone number. And as it turned out, he lived like 10 minutes away from the hospital that I, I landed in. Uh -huh. Everyone was wearing spacesuits in this hospital room. Right. I just wanted to know what bloody year You're it was. You were in quarantine, I was right? in quarantine. Yeah. Ha. So I was quite, let's say, 90% deaf, 90% blind. I was breathing one time a second. I had a heart, resting heart rate of about 140 from memories. Could I you was, do? I actually had quite spastic body movements. Uh -huh. I couldn't really control my body. My tongue was fat. I could move, but um, it was a little bit, like, uncontrollable. And because I'd, I'd lost so much weight in that 10 days, I was 42 kilos. Oh, my gosh. And I was peeing and pooing into tubes. Yeah. And I had this life support machine on only my top left lobe, but my lung was working. And um, the life support machine had burst all the capillaries in my eyes, so I looked like I was looking through Swiss cheese, you know. Oh. But when the moment of death actually came, it was actually to surrender to my own death was a, a very graceful experience, actually. It wasn't, it was the struggle for the period before it, but once I actually said, you know what, I'm so grateful of my life and it's now time to die. You know? My parents were actually, my brother and my father were in Singapore. They just phoned the doctor. They're on their way over. And they said to my dad, there's a really good chance you won't see someone get here. And I knew they were coming, so I was doing everything I could. Right. But I said my last few words and then I just entered into this. You the work? Yeah, yeah. I still got that. A nurse wrote them down and I've still got that piece of paper. Okay. I just mentioned to my parents that I was really grateful for everything that they'd um, given me. I thanked my brother and my sister. I thanked one of my best friends. And I had a long-term girlfriend, and I really thanked her and said, you know, fall in love with somebody else. That were my ending words. You know. um, but... Um, but wait, you're still here, so what happened? Yeah, so... <laughs> <laughs> Something oh, really like <laughs> so Cam he was the chiropractor this is the chiropractic lead, he was the chiropractic company every day and I'd never met Cam. He was this total he was the brother of a really good friend of mine from college that I used to live with. And he was coming in every day and he was like so committed to my well being. So he was like this real anchor. He had, you know, this presence that came in and just gave me some sort of calmness. And as it turned out, he he had an apartment, a very small apartment, that he so welcomed my father and my brother into this apartment while I was in the hospital. When we came out of hospital, my brother had gone home, and my dad and I were sitting there. And, no, hang, and on, hang on, hang on, hang on, go back, go back. You're, you're, you just said your last words. So I just said my last words, and then I uh, closed my eyes, and I entered into this near-death experience. Okay. So, 
that's when. So that's when the tunnel and the lights and the yeah. So and initially, the what actually happens is everything was like for me like a vacuum. Everything was black, and there was no life form. I was actually I had long hair then, and I was frantically looking around for life form. I was a bit panicky. Oh, really intensely panicky actually. And then so there's not there's nothing. You, know, you can't really coordinate any sort of feeling. And then in the far distance or the short distance, you can't really say, there was a pinprick of light that appeared. Right. And as that appeared, I slowly magnetically got drawn to this light. And at that moment, I actually realized that I was, that I had died. I actually realized it during the experience. Hang on, I've been sick, I've died. Oh, I'm having one of these near-death experiences that they all talk about. Uh -huh. And then very quickly, the light film started. So... Like a screen, like an enveloping thing? Like... It was almost like a, um, you know, with the new iPhone, sometimes you take <laughs> a film and they've got this line that goes along yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can cut and paste your films to fit your WhatsApp or your whatever if you like. It's a bit like, it was a bit like that, but one big continuous thing. Okay. It, the only thing is it didn't have sound in it. Uh -huh. it. It was just a silent movie. And then as I got to the end part of that film, it ended just with a big belly laughter. And then at that moment, I got right to the to the entry of this light tunnel, and I was just having my hands over my face because it was the brightest light I'd ever seen. But it was a very, very healing light. It was really warm. Everything was okay. But then I saw myself there, which was I looked at myself and I thought, "Hang on, if that's me there, who am I? Who am I?" And this question just kept. Um, repeating itself very gently, who am I, who am I, who am I? And then I guess that was the beginning of me entering the tunnel. That was the end of the separation because then I was actually back in this form of who I was, drifting down this tunnel which was, it's like a, how I could I only mean, imagine it in the earthbound planet. It was like swimming in car oil, but really nice, clean car oil uh -huh. that was light and lukewarm. And it had this viscosity that was like ecstasy. It was like getting massaged on every pore of your skin, flying, just really floating effortlessly down this tunnel. Then I get to this chamber, and there was like five or six different tunnels I could follow. I went down one, not with a choice, it just sort of randomly happened. And then it's almost like you're pop out into this, and then I was in this big uh, bubble in, in an infinite sea of existence. It was just an infinite space. And there was other little souls around. I was very much alone in that space, but I wasn't lonely at all. There was no loneliness. It's a very different quality of loneliness and loneliness. But the space was so loving and so healing and so... It was almost like if you could really receive that much love in this human body, it would hurt. Mm -hmm. That's how much love was there. So I was lucky enough to touch a very intimate <laughs> space <laughs> with, with universal intelligence. Right. And before I knew it, I remember thinking, oh, imagine just tasting food again. Or imagine hearing, listening to music again. Or imagine being able to kiss my mum again. Like... And I just gained like this appreciation for life on earth. You know, I just realized how entertaining life was and how, how even with all that suffering that we all experienced together, how beautiful it actually all is. And within an instant, it seems, I was just back fighting for life. And from the outside... And conscious of it? Not, yeah, a little bit. I was conscious. I was going in and out of consciousness, of course. But, but like, so you go from this experience to the hospital room yeah. in consciousness? Yeah, and then I'm very much back in my body, very much aware of the breathing again. So from and an outside... And not comfortable. Exactly. Or not so nothing had really changed in that sense. I was right. like, oh, I'm back in my body. But this was the big thing. This is where chiropractic starts to formulate. Is that I knew that I'd touched base, and I knew I was healed, and it was just a matter of time before the limitations of my physical body needed to catch up. Like right. this was such a healing beacon of light, a beacon of energy. So it entered you or it surrounded you or it... It was pervasive. Okay. It doesn't and, and, enter, it doesn't surround. It's and, all and, pervasive. And when you say the, 
the healing had, had the, the healing happened, right? Mm. Well, it was like a dimension of my creation energy. I was just in that. I was just dwelling in that dimension. Right. So it was everywhere. It so was, what's the difference between the, the broken state and the healed state or the... Or the separation. That's the separation. The yeah. Okay. That's the big difference. You know? And that's why I really get those 33 principles now. For me, before this experience, they were words that I intellectually wanted to understand. Right. Like especially, you know, every process takes time. Right, yeah. This is a great one for the mental mind to get and... You, know, yeah. you can intellectually understand it and talk about it a lot. But principle number one, you know, that everything's governed by this source. Wow, you know, to, to really own that now has yeah. been a really, an incredible space to craft my chiropractic work from. Okay, so I kept interrupting you. So the, where the chiropractic part came in. So then, of course, Cameron, he is a chiropractor, and he started, I, I finally got out of hospital. But I had to learn how to walk again. I had to learn how to talk again. I had to learn how to eat again. I hadn't eaten in, in months. And um, I had no strength. I actually remember being just at the front of Cam's practice and I saw an 80-year-old guy get uh, stuck in a phone box. And, of course, I was totally in this um, bubble of existence. And he was trying to get out, but nobody had seen him. And I could totally um, commiserate with all his difficulties because my body was actually like his at the uh -huh. time. But I got to the phone box and we just looked in each other's eyes and we were just staring in each other's eyes for so long. <laughs> I was with my dad and we both started crying and all of a sudden this guy in the phone box was fine. We were just fine together. It was like we... And it got, life, got, life got kind of... Um, kind of trippy for me yeah, in a very manageable way though. Okay, like, okay. Because I could realise the perfectness of it all and I was still all in it. I was sitting on park benches looking at the leaves blowing the tree. I was looking at people walking down the street, the birds. I was so content even though I couldn't walk really, I couldn't talk that much. So as it turns out, Cameron adjusts me this one time and I get up off the adjusting table and I felt the same near death experience vibe creeping in and I walk out of the office and I have to go into another door and in London you go up some stairs and then there's a little plateau and then you go up another bit of step and I actually got into this blissful state and I couldn't move anymore. I was just extremely blissed out in love, especially with myself. But the fact that I could touch the carpet, look at the paint on the walls, see the light on, I was in the earth sphere. I wasn't in this near death experience. I just felt so. Um, so the connection was in the physical realm. Yeah, totally. I was without being yeah. in the process of dying. If I wasn't in the process so of dying. So it's not near death. It's just connection. It's connection. So I started to think. I dwelled in this possibility. Did that adjustment actually initiate this? Was this shit that D.D. Palmer was saying? Was that actually something real? Was this not so just a dogmatic, unscientific, whatever way you want to put on it? My experience of it was there was there was a possibility. It wasn't immediate ownership. It right. was just like, whoa, you know, hang on, I'm back in it. So I stayed in that spot for I don't know how long it was. Minutes, was, hours? No, no, it was a good couple of hours. Okay. I was just in this stairwell. And moving around or just stuck there? Just in that stuck there in that stairwell. Yeah, yeah just stayed. <laughs> very, very still. Just uh -huh. With eyes open and bliss uh -huh. and, you know. And um, conscious of being in it as totally well? Totally conscious of being in it. Totally conscious of that. And not intimidated by it. And, and afraid of breaking the connection or just... No, also not. Absolutely. With this space, which you, when you have this connection, there's non-attachment. There's okay. no attachment to anything. Okay. There's no like, oh, I want to cherish this, I want to stay in right, this. Right, right, it's, right. Like, it's like, it is what it is. Right. Yeah. Um, and that happened another time that Cameron also adjusted me. And then I started to really think this is what chiropractic is about. But I was really ill still, actually. And um, it was a really alone time for me. I finally got back to Australia. So hang on, hang on. The, the chiropractic question, right? The notionistic chiropractic question. What technique do you but don't answer that. I was just taking the test. Mm. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Anyway, sorry. So you go back to Australia. So I got back to Australia, and 
Well, actually, actually, yes. Have you spoken to Kim about the process? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And did he talk about his intention or anything? No, we haven't spoken. I haven't seen Cameron um, for a few years now. They moved back to Sydney. And also my evolution of that process kept going. Right. I saw him about two years after the experience, but it was still um, manifesting in me. I oh. still hadn't. That's a part of my evolutionary process as a chiropractor. Like I think even, like that happened in 1996. And it wasn't, years ago. yeah, and it wasn't even until, I'd say 2005 really, 10 years after right. where I really, really, really started to um, manifest my ownership around it and see the significance of the near death experience in my healing work as a chiropractor. Right. So it wasn't an instant thing, and you would think you'd have that experience so you get it, right? right. You're never going to change. And, right. But that wasn't my, I'd love to say that was my path, but my yeah. path involved a lot more. But but you're not aware of him analyzing it or no. looking no. at it? No. no we and you haven't discussed that with him? No. I wrote a book in Holland and I talked a lot more about it, of course. Um, but I, that, that's something I really love to do. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. sure. that was one of the questions on the weekend about intention. You know, would that have happened if that was a physiotherapist applying the adjustment? Golden's philosophical question, right. how does that all work? Right. I guess you'll never know. You can't do a double blinded study. <laughs> oh, near death. There you so go. this had happened to me <laughs> twice then, but still I didn't link all the time with all the adjusting that I was doing, right. that that's what I was doing. I had an inkling of it, right. and I knew the space, I was very familiar with the space. So I go back, finish my chiropractic school, I end up going to Tasmania to work with um, Ken and Karen, and Ken was just this master chiropractor, master communicator, and the office was split into two parts. He had the one side and I was on the other side, and I always sort of had my doubts that people were paying the same fees to get adjusted by him as they were with me because everybody had lots of questions for me, and Ken just danced from one room to the other. He never saw new people. He also had a PVA well above 3,000 when I was working with him. So that was a very normal number for me. Right. me. Not that he was heavy on statistics and calling me on that. It was just my own personal interest while right. I was working with him. Um, and we used to lunch every Friday. He treated me like um, the best employee that you could um, get. So I felt really privileged for that first 12 to 18 months to have somebody like Ken just guiding me. And he had me at his house, Karen. Had Joji and I at their house every week, and some, it was just a platform. Sometimes we spoke a lot about chiropractic, other times it was personal, other times it wasn't too much going yeah. on, but it was a platform that we continued very, very consistently. So people have a hard time with those numbers, because when I posted for the last seminar that uh, this one was going to be speaking and he had a PBA 2000, there was this really surprising backlash from the community uh, contesting that and or, you know, ridiculing it or, you know, over care or whatever. But let's, so let's just explain what that means, right? So this my had, at the beginning of his practice, had, a, had big pushes to get people into the practice who then stayed under regular care to the point where you were as busy as you wanted to be and were basically not accepting new people into the practice mm. and or very very limited new people in the practice you know I don't know what the number was per year but you know almost no new people in the practice and staying completely busy in a schedule mm. so if you to you know for instance if you're seeing you know just making numbers up now like 200 minutes a week and you uh, take four or five new patients a year because your 200 people a week are coming in once a week weekly over and over and over again and choosing to stay under care that's a pva of 2000 mm -hmm. um, and people have a hard time getting their heads around the numbers but basically it's an initial push to get new people in and then an educational job to get you know to, to have people understand what it is that you do the services that you're providing mm -hmm. and then them choosing to continue under care yeah basically yeah and um it's so most of our clients just chose chiropractic for, for their lifetime. Yeah, there you go. Mm. There you go. As in brushing their teeth, like it's like you know, a dentist wouldn't be, you know, and there, there would be nothing extraordinary about a PVA of uh, 
you know, twice a day daily toothbrushing. Mm -hmm. If you're a dentist, you would just explain to the people, this is what you do, and then they continue to uh, uh, brush their teeth twice a day for mm -hmm. 15 years, and, you know, you've got that mm -hmm. PVA of toothbrushing visits, right? So how I calculated it was just the number of return vi uh, visits divided by the number of new people. Yeah. That's basically how I did it. That's how everybody ways. does it. No, no, no. That's the only way to do it. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, and of course, so what I did was my strategy was to create a, um, a multi-doctor office. I actually, I'm a people's person, so I really enjoy working with people. I really wanted to have a stable team, which we somehow created. Very nice. Okay, hang on, hang on, hang on. Let's back up. Let's back up. Mm -hmm. So you're... You worked in this practice in Tasmania with this guy who's got a PBA of 3,000, so you're seeing this as a norm, and this is a key, key, key learning. And, you know, you mentioned this before as well. You see somebody else doing it, and you know, first of all, that it's possible. Secondly, that it's not rocket science because they've got that something, but it's something that human beings are doing. It's not like they're extraordinary beings. Well, huh. you could argue that humans are extraordinary beings, but uh, mm -hmm. it's not that they've got any kind of special skill or talent or whatever, it's just breaking it down and learning how they produce what it is that they're doing, mm -hmm. and then copying that to the degree that you want to mimic whatever they're doing, oh, okay. and implementing those systems. But hang on, so you, um, so you went from there, you went to Europe for family reasons, you're doing locums, um, you're seeing other practices, and you said you went into a very specifically designing, like doing goal work and designing how you wanted your environment to be. Yeah. You want to talk about that a little bit? So, uh, Jyoti and I, we didn't have a house 10 days before Dali was born, and we got down to like 50 euros of money. We really had no money, actually. So, there was a couple of chiropractors in Europe that I just phoned up and said, can you please take a holiday and let me do a local? <laughs> and luckily, there was a couple of people that answered, which was great. <laughs> But that gave me two things. It gave me a bit of time away from the new baby and the, that whole early family thing because I'd have to shoot off for two weeks at a time. And it gave me a lot of time by myself. And I, at that moment, I, I, I was desperate to really work on the business rather than in it. Why? Well, because working in it, I just noticed I had... I was just busy. Like, I didn't have a CA. I was doing um, as much appointment making as I could. I was cleaning the toilets, you know. I was I was making sure every part of the office was running. And, you and I, was, read... I just realized that I just can't be doing low leveraged things, although I would totally acknowledge the importance of the right. toilet. Right. As, as opposed to adjusting some days. That wasn't going to be a sustainable thing. But at the same time, of course, growing an office, I was a bit scared that people weren't going to come. Right. You know, like we got a second-hand mobile phone from, like, from Joti's mother. Um, we got uh, a table lent to us. We had our own camping tool stools in the in the waiting room. We had um, we were using Darling's old cotton nappies that Joti was upstairs ironing for <laughs> headpiece paper. But I had I had the skills that Kenneth passed on to me. I had the confidence. I knew what I had was right. gold chiropractic. Of course, right. I had a really strong faith in that. Um, so I had two books that I went away with, and a friend on Jersey, I did a locum out there, and he was a really uh, sweet guy, and he, this funny story, he drove this Austin Martin and this uh, Porsche he had, and I had this car waiting for me at the um, airport with the little notes blue tacked to the steering wheel, you know, just listen to the motor and drive on into these <laughs> black gloves, and it was just this, this sort of funny, um, all of a sudden, you know, I going from this... From camping, stools, the, uh, from camping stools yeah. and iron diapers yeah, exactly. <laughs> to an Aston Martin. <laughs> For example. And then also just like having this whole new baby thing, that whole stress, right. you know, yeah. transiting to that. I didn't have any friends in Holland at this stage, no family. So I was very much on my own trip. And I took two books with me. One was called The E-Myth, and that was basically about a story about a lady who um, was really good at baking pies but she wasn't so good at selling pies and creating a system to sell the pies. And I extrapolated chiropractic into that book. Okay. So that helped me set up the business structure that was... So I, it's Michael Gerber. 